Amen. Let us pray. Dear Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we ask that your word would be spoken with power and authority. It would be real to us, Lord, that it would be within our hearts. We would treasure it, Lord, that we would take it with us from here and go out and let others know that we have been in the presence of the Lord, Lord, by shining our light to others and those in need. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 You may be seated. This sermon is number 12 of the Kingdom of Heaven series, for those of you who were here when I was going through that a while ago, and uh, we're going to go through number 12 again here, because I guess I have to. <laughs> so, uh, how shall I liken the Kingdom of God? Now, something that, that we talked about then, for those of you who are here, and it's very important to understand, is Jesus' teachings on the, the Kingdom of Heaven. We can easily get in this whimsical idea that heaven is all this, uh, you know, with gold and, and streets of glass and, and everything is just so wonderful. You know, well, the kingdom of heaven isn't a wonderful place, okay? The kingdom of heaven is a very tough place, as, as those of you who uh, heard the last 11 uh, on the kingdom of heaven. Now, how do you know that? Well, you have to look at the teachings of Christ. Uh, and what does he say about it? So that's what we're looking at here. So if you back up, he's going to refer to the kingdom of heaven about 13 times, okay? He's going to say, how shall I liken the kingdom of heaven? What's it like? So he starts out simply, number one, it's like a man. Number two, it's like a grain. Number three, it's like leaven. Then it goes on. All of a sudden, you remember as uh, we were going through the series, it starts back here at the temple, and you start moving closer and closer to God. A man who had a, uh, and a grain of seed, who plants, and the leaven goes throughout the world, and then he finds a treasure, like a man who finds a treasure, a pearl, it's like a net, okay, and you start growing closer and closer to God. Then, the cow shall I like the king of heaven, it's like a king, it's like a householder, it's like a certain king, then it's like ten virgins, and now it's like a man traveling, Okay? And now, here we are with the talent. So he's comparing the kingdom of heaven to everyday things. How shall I liken the kingdom of heaven? It's simply put, it's like a man. Man was created. That's why Jesus came and he said to the Pharisees, the kingdom of God is among you. It's here now. A man. A man that walked among the poor, among the needy, among those who were, were hurting. He didn't walk, he didn't go in and walk among the Pharisees. They didn't want anything to do with him. Okay? It's like no different than the churches today. If he'd walk into the churches today, they'd reject him. They'd tell him, you, you gotta leave here. You know, and one of the and one of the really ironic things about this and is uh, it was very interesting. I think that I think most of you know Reverend Moyer who ordained me. Okay? Some of you may have had the opportunity and the privilege to meet that man. He passed away not too long ago. He's the oldest minister in this area. And what really, with the ministerium in this area, he was in the ministerium for 50-some years, you know, and he preached for 60-some. Uh, but anyhow, what really put him over the edge was when the ministerium uh, was coming to the point where they were going to put qualifications in place for any ministers that could be on the ministerium. When, when that <coughs> happened, that was it. That put him over the edge. He's you know, and that's what the comment I made. Well, if Jesus was here, he would be rejected. He wouldn't qualify to be on the, the ministerium. Amen. You know, and so he was. Just, he was just simply a man. He was a man who, who cared for people. He loved people. He walked among people, and the sinners came to him. Okay, and this, this is what you're. How shall I liken the kingdom of heaven? Okay, so what's so hard about getting back to this truth? What's so hard about living that out? Well, the reason why people don't want to live it out is because right, as soon as you do, you're rejected. You, you got the opposition. We don't want those people here. Just what they were saying to Jesus. They killed him. We don't want you, and we don't want the people who are following you here. Leave. But Jesus never changed his teaching. He said, look, how shall I liken the kingdom of heaven? It's like a man. It's like a man that has a little faith in his heart. I put it there. I created him. And that man has an opportunity. Everyone has the freedom and the right to plant that seed in this earth. You have been given that right. I don't care who you are, where you've been, or what you've done. You have the God-given right to plant your seed in this earth and have a future. In the end. And that's what God's all about. That's what he's uh, uh, here for, for salvation, for eternal, everlasting life. Yes, you've got to follow the laws of the land. Yes, you've got to do the best you can to 
to adhere to them. But no man, your First Amendment right, can stop you from serving God and stop these church doors from being closed. Amen. That's why it's here. Amen. People can keep trying and trying and trying all they want, you know, but what are, what are they going to say to God? I mean, how can, how can you ever deny a human being their right, a, a refuge in a sanctuary? How can you ever deny any human being a right to come in to a, a cover of protection? Do you even know that, that, it, it, that if uh, somebody is homeless, okay, if somebody is homeless or if you're out in a, in a winter storm and you're homeless and there is an abandoned house with signs up to say no trespassing, okay, and you seek refuge in that house for that reason, that, that is not a violation of law. There's, there's case law that says the judges ruled that that was for you to seek protection and, and refuge. So therefore, you did not, you are not under the penalty of trespass. So then, so you come along, you open up a church to those in need, and they come in with ordinance and codes and try to violate you and, and shut you down for that. So Jesus comes along and he says, let me walk into the temple a minute. He goes in, he flips over all the tables, <coughs> carries a whip with him. Then, he says, I'm going to show you that this is the house of prayer and who belongs here. And he goes out and he brings in all the sick, the lame, the outcast, and he brings them into the temple and said, now there are the people that are supposed to be here. Amen. 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 I mean, I don't know. You can read it for yourself. This isn't, you know, new news. This is, this is in the Bible for you to read. Our Lord... Uh, he delivered something precious to us. It was called a word, a teaching. It was something that we needed to learn by, not a religion. He, he was bringing his power and his glory. I mean, what, what do you think he said when the, when the bleeding woman, woman came up to him and touched the hem of his gown? He said, virtue has left me. Power has left me. Where did that power go? Did it cease to exist? No. That power went into this woman who was an outcast sitting for years, who was defiled. And that woman, that virtue, went from, from Christ himself to a sinner. And that power just doesn't end. God's power doesn't cease to exist. So it went on to manifest itself. So the word came to give power to the sinners and the lost. So, so what do you want to do? Shut them off from that? I mean, just think for a moment what we're doing in our state, in our nation, to God. Not, you know, take your laws, but just think for a moment what you're doing. Granted, people make mistakes. They do things they shouldn't do. All right? and, and then they end up incarcerated or homeless, whatever. And they're in the jails and the prisons. And right now they're begging to get out. And they're trying to get into a church. And the law is saying, no, you're not allowed. God's going to have something serious to say about Serious. Yeah, very serious to say about that. All they're asking to do, now now listen, if that individual misuses that, then God's going to have something to say about that. But all that person's doing in their jail cell or out homeless, wherever they are, is saying, I just want to touch the hem of his gown, but give me the real Jesus. Yeah, you know, that's the thing. you got to give me the real Jesus. Give me true forgiveness and love. Amen. No, you know, you don't bring me in here and proselytize me into some religious fanatic, that, and I'm out of here. Just give me the real Jesus. What did Jesus do though after that that, that woman touched uh, uh, his the, the hem of his gown? What what did the one leper do? He just said, "Go now." He didn't start sitting them down and saying, no, you've got to dress properly, you've got to wear diamonds, you've got to wear a suit, you've got to wear a dress, you've got to go to church every Sunday, Bible study, every Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. And you, He did not. He said, you go. You go and you live that forgiveness of love for somebody else, the next Amen. person. Amen. How Amen. shall I like in the kingdom of heaven? It's like a man who had a grain of leaven and it began to go out into, it began to go out into the world and it became a treasure. Now, one day he's going to return and he's going to want to know what you have done with that little seed he gave you. See, that, that's where we run into <coughs> the issue here with the talent that's coming up. He's going to want to know. You know, now you know from Matthew 25, 31 to 46, the Great White Throne Judgment, uh, uh, that people are going to say, but wait a minute, we profess your name and cast out devils and we we're doing all these things. And he's going to say, that's not what I want to hear. I really don't care how religious you are. I want to know what you've done to the least of these. <coughs> what have you 
done with my word. Not how have you made yourself holy. Not how have you made yourself righteous. What have you done with my word? What have you done with what I taught you to do? Now see, people, it doesn't get complicated. The only way it gets complicated is when you let the worldly ways begin to dilute what Jesus said to do. When he said about the Good Samaritan, go do the same. You know, and, and to go out and help that person. If you believe that, that that's what you should do, you should go do it. But we don't want to do it. And then when we want to do it, we want to do it on our terms, in our way. You know, we think that because maybe we send a check to the homeless shelter, or maybe that because we bake somebody a pie, uh, you know, or we help somebody cross the road, that we've done our good deed. No, Jesus said this is something you do 24-7, and it's awful obvious. Look at how many people are in this church today. Okay, now I want you to imagine something. This is this this is Brockway, Brookville area. This area, imagine right now if churches were out there across the state and across this nation that was doing the same thing that this ministry is doing. Do you realize how many churches would be full of people? Amen. Do you? That's called rehabilitation, and that's what needs to be done. The government can't look. It's obvious that the government can't do it because if the government could do it, they wouldn't have over fifty. 3,000 inmates sitting in the prisons right now with no hope and no future. They would understand that. They, they wouldn't have homelessness all over the place. You know, 30-some thousand homeless children in our Pennsylvania schools. They wouldn't have that. And the only reason is, is because they will not get out of the road of the true church that wants to step up and do what they cannot do. Amen. Why? Because they can't get money from it. I'm going to tell you something right now. I've been, been pondering. If some family out there, I don't want to mention a name, you can make one up, you know? <coughs> some multi billionaire family put billions of dollars in, into, a, into a, a grant money for the state of Pennsylvania. Billions of dollars. And you know what it said? I want you now to open up just for Jesus Ministries in the state. Could you imagine the buzzing going on in the floor of the Senate and the representatives? No. <laughs> Could you imagine how they'd be buzzing, thinking, how can, oh, yeah, now we can do this. We can get some money here. We can, you see what I mean? Yeah, we can let this happen. <laughs> well, that's something to think about, isn't it? I mean, that's why you get the McKinney-Vento grant. You get the, the uh, people out there that have their private shelters, which are needed, but... Uh, it, it's just the stepping stones. So think about that for a moment. That's all, that's all it would take. And all of a sudden, believe me, it would be made okay. But now wait a minute, there would be some stipulations in that grant. It would say, you know, that everyone welcome. doesn't matter where you've been or what you've done. Amen. See, because the kingdom of heaven is like a man who planted a seed. You see? And... A man. That's hard for people to understand. So Jesus is going to want to know, what have you done with my forgiveness and my teaching? What have you done with what I've done for you? What have you really done? For, what did you go and do for that? See, he's going to return one day, and he's going to settle this account with each and every person. He's going to settle it. It's going to be the day of reckoning. And he's going to want to know what you have uh, done, what you've done with his resources. Not what works you've done. Not how good you were. He's going to want to know with what, you, what have you done with the resources I gave you. Forgiveness and love. You know, no matter what you're going to do, we're going to sin. I hate sin. Okay? I hate sin because I'm a sinner. That's why I hate it. I don't hate sin because somebody else sins and I don't. I hate sin because I'm a sinner. That's what John Wesley uh, professed. He said, give me a hundred ministers that hate sin and fear God, and I can change the world. Well, guess what? It didn't happen. He didn't say, give me a hundred ministers that aren't sinners. He said, give me a hundred ministers that hate sin. See, the problem is, people go around, they hate sin because they don't think they're a sinner. They think someone else is. That's not the way Jesus was teaching you hate sin because you know you're a sinner. And you know that sin is in the world. And you found forgiveness at the cross and everybody has a right to that same forgiveness. Matthew 25, 
verses 14 and 15. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, and to every man according to his ever ability, and straightway took his journey. Jesus came and he gave and he left. To some a little more than others. And then off he goes. To everyone he gives. Five, two, and one. Okay? Different levels, but all the same. Okay? He gives one, he gives... Uh, uh, the talents two, and he gives five, and the other he gives two, and to another one he gives one. Okay, kind of the bride, the bride, those who are uh, five talents, a little more, can go out and do a little more. Uh, the, the saints, the apostles, uh, the teachers, uh, could be anybody called by God to that level. Then two, and then one. How shall I liken the kingdom of heaven? Then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same and made them other five talents. And likewise, he that had two, he also gained another two. Notice he went and traded the same. He never changed it. See, he went and traded the same. He didn't turn the word of God into something different. He kept it the true word of God. He kept it what it was supposed to be, and he got back what it was supposed to be. Not anything different. You don't compromise with the Word of God. Compromising with the Word of God has turned our church into what it is today. We traded something different, and we got back something different, didn't we? Sure we did. Would Jesus recognize the majority of the churches today? No, he would not. Because... We traded. The leadership traded something different. They compromised and they got back something different. You can't come to this church because you're an offender. You can't come to this church because you don't dress right. You can't come to this church because you don't believe this way. You can't come to this church because you're not this religion. And on and on. They trade something different. But he kept it the same. He got back the same. He used the same word given to him. The same gospel. And in return, he got it back. Verse 18, but he that had received one went and digged in the earth and hid his <coughs> Lord's money. He hid it in the earth. See, he went out to profess it, but he hid it. He hid it because he's living under the law. See, he had it, he knew it was there, but he hid it. Because he wanted to be popular in the world. He, he, so he lived under the law. He lived under, you know, the American way. And go out and do as we do. I don't want to live for Christ. Every time I try to do something for Christ, I get rejected and persecuted. If I truly try. So, so I'll just be religious. I'll hide it. Uh, I'll know where it's at. See, I'll remember where it's at. He didn't lose it. I'll just cover it up and put it away and Nobody will really know that I have it. I'll just tell them when I want to that I have it. You know, it's like the baby Jesus, you know. We get the baby Jesus out for Christmas and put him out, and then all of a sudden we put him away for a year. Yeah, you might next year, you might forget where you put him, you know, for a moment. But you'll find him, won't you? You'll get out the tail and you'll look at it a little bit, and then you'll put it away again. You didn't lose it, but you just hit it. Sure. See, this person doesn't know how to experience the love of God. See? They don't know how to experience that. Could, now listen, see, something that we don't quite understand, something that, that a lot of people don't understand uh, in the teachings of Christ, do you realize that, number one, Jesus says that your faith is what makes you whole, right? Mm -hmm. If you have faith in Him, and, and you believe in Him, it's that that's going to change you and help you, if you, if you truly believe that. And it will. So, so think about this for a moment. Imagine your Lord walking, okay? Now, remember He said in John 17, He prayed, The glory you've given Me, I have given them. Okay? Sure. Now, you, can you imagine? Jesus said, Now your faith makes you whole. And here comes this woman, and she touches the hem, and all of a sudden, she's healed. And He says, Power has left Me. Power has been removed from Me. Can you, can you imagine the blessing Christ received? 
not only did the woman receive the blessing of healing, the glory, but somebody actually believed in him that much that he felt the glory. Imagine that. That was God now. Somebody believed in him that much that they were healed. Now imagine Christ went, wow, who touched me? Wow, that's the line there. You just Amen. Amen. I mean, you know, yes. we always think it's always about us, don't we? We never, we don't really think how Christ feels. So what do you think will happen to you if you truly go out and open up the doors and begin to let those people that are outcasts, rejects, you know, nobody wants them. And they come in and touch your hem. You see their lives change. You know, that you see them have a future, and now they are loved. What do you think that would do to you? Come on, now, that's what Jesus said. As much as you do this to the least of these, you've done it to me. <laughs> what do you think Paul learned? What do you think Peter learned? He learned, <coughs> learned that these people, remember they, uh, Peter, they said, we just want his shadow to hit us. <laughs> what do you think uh, Peter felt like? When somebody came up and prayed with him or touched him or, or you know, and, and just thought for a moment that they were healed, it was all Christ. Can you imagine? That man went on to die for that. See, a lot of us get so self-centered, we don't want anyone near us. That's what happens. We don't want the real church around us. We're too busy making money. We're too busy keeping everything in our little utopia, a little perf perfect here. But Jesus comes along and says, wait a minute. I don't care how beautiful your utopia is. I don't care how beautiful your town is. Guess what? When I come, you're going to know it. Because I'm going to be like a man. Who planted the seed. Yeah, I I'm going to be a man that doesn't fit in. I'm going to be a man that has been beaten down and hurt. I'm going to be a man that's made mistakes. Now, this isn't Jesus. This is you. I'm going to be the people who can't keep up with the world the way the world says it should be. So Jesus says here, go ahead. Compromise with the world or compromise with me. You know? Go ahead. Go out and, and live the world and build your cities and innovate and, and create and over here, you say to this person, now what do you want? Go. Get involved in that. Go live for Satan and build this world. Or, you're going to live for me. Well, what does that mean, Lord? That means you're a man that needs to plant a seed. You're a sinner. You don't fit in. You're an outcast. You know, you're in the land of misfits. Yeah. But why, Lord? Why? Oh, because one day I'm going to use you to show my glory and show you what hell really looks like as you walk into the kingdom of God. Amen. If you truly know me as Lord and Savior. You mean so I can't go? I can't go to Walmart and buy any religious stuff, and you know, because that's what we do. Churches are like walking to Walmart anymore. We walk in and we look around and see what we can get or grab to make ourselves feel good, don't we? Mm -hmm. Sure, we do. This man's efforts were in what? Digging a hole in the ground, huh? Mm -hmm. It's like an ostrich when they're scared they stick their head in the ground. <laughs> yeah. So he goes and he puts his effort in digging and hiding. Claiming the word, hiding the word, remembering where it's at. There's where his efforts are. Some people think because they have their baptism certificate up on the shelf that they're good to go. Uh, I hope you're not thinking that way. See, the little bit he had, he did not know how to use, nor did he want to know. <coughs> and unfortunately, it was maybe taught. It wasn't taught properly. He <coughs> used a little bit that he had. 
Listen carefully. These are the people who think they know the scripture. They think that they're righteous. They think they know God. They think they can instruct God. They think they can tell Him what to do. I hope you're, you're understanding what the real power of God is like and what it means. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. You can't praise God until you please God. <coughs> how many times how many times in your life were you denying Jesus that moment of glory he deserves how many times is he standing right there with you waiting for you to touch the hem of his gown and be healed and you refuse can you imagine how many people how many people that he walked by knowing that all they had to do was believe and reach out, and they would not do it. And there's many in this room today. You just refuse. And every time Jesus tries to get closer and closer to you, you get nervous, huh? Come on, you know this one. Like in the boat, you know? Jesus in the boat with the disciples. You make us nervous. Peter said, get away from me. I'm a sinner. You start getting nervous. But as Jesus draws closer and closer to you, you get nervous, don't you? Good. He should be doing that in your life. And then you have to tell yourself, is this the moment? Is this the moment for me to be delivered from cigarette smoking, tobacco use, foul language, drug addiction, alcoholism? Anger problems? Is this the moment? And you think it's all about you? Maybe you need to start thinking, is this the moment for Christ to receive the glory due to Him? Amen. For the moment Amen. when He Amen. says, virtue has been removed from me? Amen. Amen. Wow. <clears throat> That's an experience you'll never ever forget, I'm going to tell you. Ever. Some of you get so close to touching that, you say no. Satan comes right in there, not Satan himself. Satan is somewhere else, you know. Uh, I'm not going to go there today. You know, he's, he's probably at the Capitol or the White House or somewhere trying to do something, you know. But the influence of him comes in and he takes right in a heartbeat. You don't touch the hand. But you still remember where your, your tail is hidden. Yeah, somewhere. The power of God. Verse 19, after a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. The reckoning. That means to calculate. It means to lay one at charge. It means having like force. How will you stand in the day of the reckoning? Jesus comes back, he's not coming back for fun and games. He's not going to come back and tell everybody how wonderful of a job that you've done. No? No, no. Well done, good and faithful servant. It's going to be like, we made it. Yeah. Wow. He was right. Look at them going into hell. Yeah, we just think it's just going to be well, wonderful. It's like, uh, like uh, what, what was the, the witch in Oz that come floating in the bubble? <laughs> Linda? Was it Linda? <laughs> the <laughs> witch? <laughs> thing. Oh, just like, that, that's what we're in. We're like in this re religious uh, utopia bubble that, that this is all wonderful. No, it isn't. That bubble's going to be popped one day. And I hope to pop as many as I can while I'm walking this earth. Amen. 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 See, the law was given to us, a debt for us, to renounce that we cannot make ourselves holy by the law. It's a free gift by grace. We can't make ourselves holy. We can't live under the Old Testament laws, the laws of the land, and then take the new covenant of Jesus Christ across, 
wrap it up and go hide it and dig it in the ground. Say that we know him and then live under laws of religiosity and say that we are Christians. When grace comes, the love of God comes, it cancels all that and that talent is supposed to come alive in you. Well, what does that look like? It looks like the love of Christ bringing all those people in. The same. This is where the one talent stands. Let's look. Let's go to Romans. Let's go to Romans 3. Nineteen and twenty. Romans three. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. <coughs> Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. The law was given us to show us that we are sinners. So there's no way we can rely on the law to be justified. Because God gave us the law to show that we would never be able to live up to his standards. Period. So we can't live under that Old Testament principle of the law. Can't be done. It will stop every mouth. Now do you see why the people saying, but Lord, Lord, we profess your name according to the law. We cast out devils according to the law. We were all religious according to the law. We prayed according to the law. He's going to say, I don't know you. Stop. There's no virtue in that. There's no power in that. You did not do it to the least of these. You never reached out to the least of these. Therefore, I never received any glory or power from you. The glory you have given me, I have given them. And Jesus gave glory back to the Father. What are you giving? A bunch of laws? bunch of head knowledge principle principles? Are you going out there with the true love of Jesus Christ and making yourself available for that next person that walks through that door into your life? You just may need those few words of understanding that they're forgiven and loved. What good can you make a human being, people, if you would treat them like a lot of people in this community and the surrounding areas in this state and the world treat people that are incarcerated or homeless or have mental illness. What do you think if we, if God would let that go? Could you imagine if God, right now, people, let's take a moment, and if God would remove his grace from the state of Pennsylvania and he would let the community start treating and the people like they're saying about this ministry, what do you think would happen? Could you imagine how barbaric it would be? <coughs> People say there isn't a God. I'm going to tell you right now, if there wasn't a God, you know what you would see? You would see multitudes of people chained together, uh, being marched through towns to the next slave camp. That's what you would see. If there wasn't a God, you know what else you would see? You'd see so many people so drugged up, you would see uh, uh, laboratories and chemistry labs just filled up with guinea pigs. That's what you would see. You would see mansions going up and the rich getting richer. You would see everything becoming this, this colored picture of beauty, utopia, and then you would just see human beings turned in to animals. Is that what you want? No. no. That's all we have. You know what we have to do? Let's just quit fighting for, for, for the true cause of Christ. Why don't the church just step up and say, like they want to say, yeah, we don't need these people. They shouldn't be here. You 
to tell you something. You want to try something? Go take a dog and tie a dog out here in a chain without a doghouse. And you watch how fast somebody calls in and you'll see the SPCA here. Yeah. But you let a homeless person walk by, you'll go give them a home. They're just a human being. Isn't that crazy? Do you know that the one cause, I, I told you this a long time ago, and this was a representative or senator, I'm not, I'm not real sure now. But anyhow, uh, unfortunately, this is a true story. He lost everything because of a sickness that hit the family, lost everything. Every, he was down, and the wife died through cancer, and he was down to his car and his dog. That was it. And he was living in, a, in Walmart parking lots and wherever he could. Here, the SPC went and took his dog. <laughs> Left him in the car. That's true. <coughs> and we live in a sick world. Why? Because we live under the law. law. The law is given to us to remind us that we never can fulfill. Now, it doesn't mean you don't try to live it. We all have to try to do the best we can. And we must and we should. And we need to apply it. But we've got to always remember we all fall short of it. And everybody's mouth is going to be stopped if you even try to mention it to God. Okay? If you look at Romans 4, 4 to 8. Romans 4. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. Okay? So here we are according to grace. Now to him that worketh is the reward not uh, reckoned of grace, but of debt. So it's according to debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. See? So he that worketh, now look, he that worketh, okay, and tries to work, is not reckoned of grace, but of debt. It becomes a debt. It becomes sin. And there's a payment for that sin. See, if you try to work to get into heaven, if you try to work and base it on that work, you are basing it on sin, because God comes and says, look, no man can fulfill the law. And if you try to do that, then you're basing it on sin, because I said so. Law wasn't given to make you righteous, it was given to make you and show you you're a sinner. So if you base it on the law, then you are basing it on sin. Therefore, there's no justification, and you will face the reckoning. But to him that worketh not, that means to him that understands that, that you don't work the law, but you adhere to the law. You don't work it. But you understand it. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, Christ Jesus, his faith is counted for righteousness. Amen. How shall I liken the king of heaven, like a man, a little bit of faith, that believed in Christ? So what is it that is going to erase all the sin and <coughs> usher you into the kingdom of God? It is going to be faith in the one who can justify you. That's all the who? The ungodly. Justifieth the ungodly. Well, wait a minute. We don't want those ungodly sinners in our church. There's only one thing that can make you say that. You know what that is? You're working the law. So what that means is you're working sin. Because the law shows you are a sinner. And if you want to show yourself a sinner... Go and work the laws of God and see what happens to you. Go and work them. They'll turn you into holier than thou, self-righteous person. We'll see what God has to say about it. You know what it'll do to you? It'll put you in some denomination out there that says, well, unless you do this, that, or the other thing, you're not welcome here. It might put you in a, uh, in a denomination that, that says, hey, spaghetti dinners and bingo and all that good stuff, that's the way to go. We close our doors at this time. We lock them up. Yeah. Or just come, come and do what we do. Let me slap you in the face and you're good. Some of you may know what that means. Yeah. 
You don't have to do anything till next Sunday now, if you want to. So you start working the law, but see people when you work the grace of God, the love of God, okay? And you let that come alive in you, you will begin to fulfill what Christ taught. And you will see too that those doors of the church, the church doors are open always. And they would never be closed and locked. Why do you think Jesus, come on, don't you think Jesus knew this? Here's another thing I want to tell you something. Uh, okay. Hmm. There was, when you, when you look at Jesus saying, I stand at the door and knock. I mean, back then, they didn't really have churches built, did they? <coughs> they had the synagogue, the temple. Well, he, he was seeing something in the future, wasn't he? A lot of locked doors, huh? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. The church doors. You've locked my church up. And he's knocking, and he's knocking, and he's knocking, and the doors are locked, the doors are locked, and the doors are locked. Why? Because people are working the law. And not necessarily the law of God, the law of man. It became the American way to have church service on Sunday morning, Bible study Wednesday night, and the church is locked in between. You know something that really bothers me? Some of you, and this bothers me a lot that I almost want to stop and say something about it, but I don't. And, and uh, I, I know it even bothered me when Reverend Moyer was, was there, and I wanted to talk to him about it. I may have, uh, and, but I don't think I did. You know at night when I go through Crenshaw, did you ever go through Crenshaw at night and see the lights on in the church? There? No. Huh? Man, it's beautiful. It's the, the, it just looks like. And it, if, if I had that church, those lights would be on every single night. You know, every single night when, uh, when you would drive by there, you would see the, the lights of that church on and the door would be open. Every night. You, you know, that, I'm going to tell you something. You drive by there at night with, and catch it when the lights are on. It's almost like you want to pull in there. It is. It's almost like you want to pull in. So imagine if that was on and the door was open. Imagine how many people would be ministered to over the years. Oh, man. Jesus said, like a man that planted a seed. And the church becomes what? A talent hidden in the ground, just hidden there. Lights out, heat shut off, doors locked. Afraid to open it up. Afraid of who might really come in. You know, then they said, well, we gotta lock our church because you know what? We got a lot of gold and silver in there, and people will steal it. Well, get rid of the gold and the silver then. Amen. So, Amen. What do you need the gold and the silver and all that fancy stuff for? Keep the thief honest. Instead of having gold and silver and, and crystal, why don't you have bread and water and soup? Amen. Oh, there's going to be a reckoning coming. Because I just touched on the communion. That's what the communion is all about. sell some of the gold and the silver. Take out some of the stained glass window. Put some plastic up. Why not? What's worse, living in an abandoned building in a cardboard box under the bridge? <coughs> That's a little bit too radical, but I don't care. I like to be radical, you know. <laughs> because, if, like I said on the sign, if you think I'm radical, you wait till Christ turns back. Wait till Christ comes back. He's going to turn, turn the world upside down. Amen. Because obviously we aren't doing a very good job for him. Uh, that's too bad. Makes me sad. It really does. 
Romans 6, 23. Romans 6, 23. For the wage of the sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The wages of sin is death. There's a price to pay for sin. You're going to get a paycheck. That paycheck is death, eternal, everlasting hell. There isn't a paycheck for eternal life. It's a free gift. It's handed to you by Jesus Christ on the cross. <coughs> it is free to every single person who wants that. But if you're out there working the law, and you're working for a wage, you're working for eternal, everlasting punishment, and you don't even know it. Jesus came to, to change that. Where there is law, there is sin, people. And you'll receive that paycheck. When there is true faith, there's freedom indeed. It doesn't give you the right to sin. No, not at all, God forbid. But it gives you the right to eternal everlasting life, like any other self-righteous religious hypocrite thinks he has. something that Jesus came to teach. Not freedom to do what you want, but freedom to do what you ought to do and what you should do. You must fight for this battle. Let's go back to Matthew 25. Verse 20. And so he that received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful. Servant, thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee roar over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. He also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents beside them. His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee roar over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Grace for grace and faith for faith is what they gave. Once they found the love of Christ, they gave the love of Christ. It didn't matter who it was or where they went. This is to be free indeed, abundant life, people. Now I want you to notice something here. You've got three people. Okay? And this one guy now. He's hearing this. He, he hid his. He didn't get it. And he hears the one said, here's five. And the other one said, here's, he's over here shaking. Well, wait a minute. They're probably looking at each other. You know, they know something's coming up. And the one servant hears, well done. He goes, man, all right. And the second one, man, all right. And now here's the next guy coming along. Be a little bit nervous, aren't you? You're going to be a little bit nervous? You start wondering, well, what did I do with my talent? Is it still here? Did I get it out? Did I use it right? <clears throat> then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art a hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid, and went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast that <clears throat> Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not, and gather where I have not strawed. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming I should have received my own with usury. Here's a man or woman who has good knowledge, thinking themselves right, and they question God. They call God unfair. This is what you do when you're under the law. You call God unfair. You try to make God fair. You try to make God into something that he isn't. Yeah, that's what you do under the law. It's happening all the time. It's happening all over this morning, this Sunday morning. To say you are better or more holy than someone else. <coughs> you're saying God is unfair then. The paycheck for the law is death. And there is no payment. There's no works in God's grace. 
Now it's power within you to work, the love of the Son. That's what's in you, which covers all sin. <coughs> Jesus says, you wicked and slothful servant. You call me a hard man? You say that I am unfair? Take therefore the talent from him and give it unto him which has ten talents. For unto every one that has shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that has not shall be taken away even that which he has. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. See, that when that, when that bleeding woman came up and gave back to Christ and touched that hem, he said, virtues come out of me. Power. Who's glorified me? Who believed in me that much? And the other servant comes and he says, Here, Lord, here's five. And touches him and he says, Well done. You've glorified my name. And the other one says, Two. And he touched him and he received. Jesus was glorified. And the one comes and says, I'm not touching you. <coughs> Here it is. I'm not touching you. Listen to what he said now. Jesus said, neither will I touch you. You give it to the others. You just became hell. You never gave to anyone else. Instead, you oppressed them. You rejected them. You lived under the law. Neither will I touch you either. Worse yet, I won't even touch the seed that I planted in you. <coughs> <coughs> Give it to the others. Imagine Jesus that he never gave his true love and forgiveness to others. So much was your wicked heart because you were so self-righteous and religious that when the time comes to give it back to him, he doesn't even want it. And instead, he's going to give that little bit of glory over to those who deserve it. I like in the kingdom of heaven a man who plants a seed I hope you're ready for this reckoning that's coming because this is what it all leads up to see of all the disciples Paul was the one who would recognize and understand this the most let's look quickly at 1 Corinthians <coughs> For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. What will ye? Shall I come unto you with a rod, or in love, and in the spirit of meekness? How shall I liken the kingdom of God? It's power. The kingdom of God is going to come in power, and that's what it's virtue has left me. When you truly touch the hem of Christ. When you truly experience that virtue, love, and forgiveness, people, you will never hold it in. You will always give it to others. That's true salvation. 
powers residing in a person by virtue of its nature, which a person exerts and puts forth. <coughs> Remember your human nature? We talked about that. Human nature will knock you down. It's Christ's nature that you need. Power means residing in a person by virtue of its nature, by virtue of the teachings of Christ, by virtue of the love of God, which a person exerts and puts forth to another. That's imparting. That's what angel means. It's the operation of God, the unseen faith within you. The kingdom of God within you. You need to notice this misled one talent. Was it taught properly? You know what? God is saving souls all over the world. He really is, but you know what the churches are saying? A lot of you are saying out there, oh Lord, I was afraid. I was afraid to go out among those sinners. How dare you? How dare you? And this is what the church is saying to God, the one telling. How dare you go out where you did not sow? You didn't plan out in the homeless. You didn't plan out in those jails and prisons where all those people are. You didn't plan. Those aren't your people. How dare you? You didn't go out and do that. I was scared to, so I went and hid mine. You're an unfair man. You, you wanted, wanted me to go where you didn't plan. God's saying, who are you to tell me where I planted my children at? Who are you to tell me where I'm working? Well, you surely would not work in the prisons and in the jails and in the homeless out there living in cardboard boxes in the mental health units. I was afraid to go. I didn't want to go. And what about you? What are you afraid of? you got a ministry here and a teaching here to do. Now, you're sitting in dangerous territory. You can either do it or you can just go and, and become religious. You can do whatever you want. It's up to you. It's your choice. That's the problem with the church. Everybody wants to take from God, but they don't want to get back. God will put a roof over your head, and he'll put food in, in front of you. And you know what? You don't want to get back. One time I had someone come in here. It was a wicked. You know the wicked stuff? Okay, well, anyhow. I'm sitting right here. Walked in the first night. What can your God do for me? I'm a Wicca and I'm a cat. I said, well, okay. <laughs> You're a cat. Good. Yeah, I start going off on this Wicca stuff. Okay. What can your God do for me? You know, and sitting there. Now remember, this person is sitting there with a Bible in their hand. <laughs> and I let her go. And I said, well, I'll tell you what my God can do for you. He just put a roof over your head. He put a Bible in your hand. Amen. 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 <laughs> Very simple. <laughs> yeah, that person, uh, a month later, walked up here and was accepted Christ as Lord and Savior. Amen. 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 What are you going to do? You know, this is what, I'm afraid to go out. This is what you're hearing. I'm afraid to go out among those people. There's no way you plan it out there. He's going to say, you wicked people. How dare you tell me where I plant, where I don't. I'm God, I'll do whatever I want. I told you to get out there with my word and live it. I said all nations. You go in all the world, all places. But we were afraid. We don't want those people around us. There's no way you've done that. This is why I'm going to tell you something as we close up here. The next step is Matthew 25, 31 to 46 after this parable. is the great white throne judgment. You know what, people, I'm going to tell you something, you in this ministry, and you pass it on, you pass it on to the inmates and the homeless out there. These wise up. You get Christ in your life and you start living for Him. Because I'm going to tell you something. You are the ones that are going to give Him glory because I'm going to, the two-faced religious churches out there are not. Amen. 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 All they're Amen. doing is going through the motions, singing and dancing, and they aren't. But I'm going to tell you right now, there's a lot of you with, with struggles. There's a lot of you with unforgiveness and unfinished business in your life. And all you have to do is reach out and touch the hymn of Christ. 
and give him the glory he deserves. You have that opportunity, but don't forget something. Now you've got to get out there into places where others say that God isn't walking. Among the homeless and the poor. And start letting them know there is a place. There is a future for them. Are you able to do that? Yes. Amen. Amen. I hope so. Because he's going to want to know on the day of reckoning what you have done. Yeah, and there's many of you here today that, you know what? There's a lot of people you could help if you really wanted to. You know, the thing is, we don't really want to. There's some of you today that have a lot of scars and hurts and pains in your life and your past and mistakes you've made. And there's somebody out there just waiting to hear how you got through it and Christ changed your life. Then why don't you go find that person? God forbid that we keep the churches open 24-7 so that person can come in here. Huh? God forbid you do that. You know, I can understand, I can understand somebody who isn't a Christian wanting to shut down and, and, and put a stumbling block in front of a shelter like this. I can understand that. I can't understand somebody who calls himself a Christian and darken the door of a church doing it. Amen. I can't. I think it is the most hypocritical. It's just spitting right in the face of Jesus Christ. And I cannot wait till that day I stand at the great white throne. I cannot <laughs> wait till that day when I stand before God because I'm going to hold my head up. I'm going to hold my head up and I'm going to wait and see. And if what I'm doing here is wrong and if what I'm doing here is not right, I will walk right into the fires of hell. I have no problem with that. Amen. Amen. But on the other side, there's four tongues out there. I hope they're thinking the same way. And I don't want to watch, watch that happen to anyone. But I'm not going to stop doing what I'm doing. Amen. 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 See, I fear the Lord in a different way. Not a fear that I'm afraid of Him, like this man was with the one talent. No. It's a fear of the utmost respect. You know why? Because a man came along, a simple man, a man that knew how to work, he knew how to bleed, he knew how to get hungry, he knew how to be thirsty. He knew how to sit down during the day and talk with people and love them. He knew what it was like when somebody sitting across the roadway that was an outcast would look at him with those eyes of pity and shame. And he would look at them and they would know that they're accepted no matter who they were or what they've done. He would have so many people coming up, weeping to him, crying, not knowing what to do. Not knowing if they would be rejected or not. Just like the bleeding woman, she didn't know. She could have been dead right there, touching a Jew. It was her last chance. But something in that man's face triggered her to do it. As she watched year after year, and watched him teaching, something, she was beholding his face. He was real. He was just a man. He was a man that forgave and loved, and we're supposed to live the life of that man. I respect that man, and I respect that he died for my sins and all of your sins. He died so we can get our minds, and I can get my mind out of the works and trying to be this holier-than-thou person and get out there and build the church that he said. Bring my people. Let the cross, the power of it, do the sanctifying. Let it do the work it's supposed to do. Amen. You just show the love of my son to all people. Amen. Amen. That is what I fear. I fear that not being done. Because I respect that man, Jesus Christ, and his love above and beyond anything in this world. And I will die for it, and I will live for it. And that's what this is all about. And if that's the only thing you've got to give him back, you are going to put a smile on God's face. That's all. So instead of getting down on yourself because of your past mistakes, hurts, and pains, you remember, you can take them and help the next person get through them. See, what we do is those past hurts and pains people, you know what they really are? You're telling. See, 
see it's the works of sin that become that can become the glory of God. Don't have to be ashamed. Jesus healed those people and sent them out into the community. They brought their talents to him. They brought their sin to him. Some worse than others. The leper brought his talents to him and Jesus said, well done. You're healed. So quit burying all of your shortcomings and hurts and unfinished business. You went through all those things for a reason. Now you learn by them, and you let Christ turn them to good. And now, you go and do the same for others. And help them. How shall I liken the kingdom of heaven? churches are gun shy out there. That's the reason why they're afraid. They've been used and abused and they've never been taught properly. So instead of going, when you leave here and you move on, instead of going and, and getting into a church and taking from it, you go and give back. You go and say, here, I had five, now I got five to give you back. I can show you the love of Christ. But instead, what do you do? You go up to the church and you walk in. You have your one talent hid, you have nothing to give back. And they say, away from me. You're just going to use the church again. Hmm. Something to think about, huh? A lot of you come in this door with your one talent. <clears throat> oh, yeah. Some of you just go right back out. So I suggest those of you who come in here, you get your one talent, you get it out of the ground. You get it opened up, you appreciate the love that Christ has for you, and you learn that you are a forgiven person. And the unfinished business in your past, you can't have it finished. Jesus says it is finished. And he will finish it for you. And you make ready to give back to him and hand it to him with your head up in the air, knowing that the love of Christ is within your heart, mind, and soul. And you're not afraid to help the next person that comes into your life, that comes through that door. I hope you're ready for the day of the reckoning. And you're truly ready for the kingdom of God. But before you are ready for the kingdom of God, you must first make yourself ready in the kingdom of heaven. Not by works, but by Christ's love. Let us pray. Dear Father, we thank you, Lord, for all you're doing in our lives. We thank you, Lord, for your love and forgiveness. And Lord, we ask that you would help us to understand just how important it is to live your life among each other, with each other, whether we're here or out in the community, Lord with our family or friends, Lord, that we would always be ready to give back the love and forgiveness that you have given us. Teach us this, Lord, through the power of the Holy Ghost, that we may grow every day in your truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.